guys, today I'm joined by Dr. Gordon Walker, who has his PhD in biochemistry, molecular, cellular, and developmental biology. Welcome. Hey, Christian. It's good to be here. My first question is, when did you develop your passion for fungi? <laughs> I had some very uh, catalyzing sort of experiences as a child. Uh, I was out on a walk with my mom when I was like five years old, and we found this massive puffball, probably bigger than the size of my head. And I'm very food motivated. So not only was it an exciting find, but when we took it home, my mom told me we could eat it. And we sliced up these big marshmallowy steaks of incredible mushroom umami goodness. Uh, I was hooked. And it's sort of that, that passion and that interest has, has stayed with me for, for my entire life, even though it has gone up and down in terms of the amount of time I, I think about it. Yeah, that's really fascinating, your story and how you became very interested in fungi. So what is the difference between fungi and plants? That's a great question. Uh, for a long time, fungi and plants were lumped in together. And it wasn't until about the 70s that they finally differentiated them into different kingdoms. And the biggest differentiation between fungi and plants is that plants use the energy of light to fix CO2 from the atmosphere in what's called uh, anabolic, an anabolic process because they're building up sugars, whereas mushrooms and fungi are more like animals in the sense that they're catabolic. They like to break stuff down. So they take sugars and organic compounds and break them down or recycle them to generate soils. So that's, that's where plants and fungi are really different. Yes, and I was just going to get to that. So how does fungi exactly um, thrive, grow, and multiply? Uh, I mean, they are everywhere. Fungi are ubiquitous. They are on every surface, and there's a lot more of fungi than we think about. There's a ton of uh, molds and yeast and single-celled fungi and things that we would never recognize as like a mushroom, but the fungi kingdom is, is super diverse. And, uh, and inhabits pretty much every niche in life, inclu including like, you know, aquatic and extreme environments. There's fungi pretty much everywhere. Mm -hmm. Yes. And can you explain more about the, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, the mycorrhizal um, Mycorrhizal, fungi. yeah. Yeah, so mycorrhizal fungi are really important, and I think it's something that's been largely ignored in some ways in the history of life. Uh, when... Something, you know, several billion years ago when plants came to land, um, there was no soil. There was no way for plants to be on land. And I think what they're kind of looking at as a hypothesis now is that plants and fungi came to land together. So there was sort of always an almost an obligate symbiosis between plants and fungi where what they formed what's called a mycorrhizal relationship where the fungus is providing structure to the roots of the plant and increasing the surface area and vastly uh, increasing the ability of the plant to uptake water and nutrients from the soil because the fungi have uh, much, much finer hairs and are able to get cover a much wider area uh, with their fungal network than just a plant root alone. But the fungus and the plant are hooked into each other, so the mushroom is getting its sugars from the plant, which is, is producing them from photosynthesis from the sun. And then the plant is getting all of its water and nutrients being absorbed from the soils by the fungi. So that's kind of what a, a mycorrhizal relationship is. Mm -hmm. And are there more of these in different environments? Uh, there are, I mean, about 90% of the plants on the planet are mycorrhizal. And there is a difference between what we call mycorrhizal, that's arbuscular mycorrhizae and ecto mycorrhizae. So arbuscular mycorrhizae are sort of small fungi that often live inside of plant cells and don't um, don't produce fruiting bodies. So we don't recognize them as mushrooms necessarily, but most plants on this planet have at least some arbuscular mycorrhizae associated with them. And then there's ectomycorrhizal fungi, which are what produce most of the, the large, um, exciting fruiting bodies and mushrooms that we are you know interested in. And those those occur in a lot of the temperate forests, and they make up a huge amount of the the fungal biomass that's in the soil. Mm -hmm. And what are um, mycoheterotrophs? Mycoheterotrophs are super interesting. So I was just talking about the relationship between a plant and a fungi and how they're sort of linked together. So mycoheterotroph is another plant that is parasitizing the mycelium 
network or mycelial network. And these are non-photosynthetic plants. So they don't have any chlorophyll. They don't do any photosynthesis. They're entirely dependent on their parasitic relationship with the mycelium, which is dependent on its other plant that is doing photosynthesis. So it's this kind of crazy relationship where you have, you know, a tree that is doing lots of photosynthesis, a mycorrhizal network that is, you know, exchanging nutrients with the tree. And then this other microheterotroph that is parasitizing sugars um, indirectly from the tree. And they produce these gorgeous flowers that have, you know, white and red, and they look totally unreal and are just absolutely gorgeous. And for a long time, people thought they were just parasitic. And now they're realizing that these microheterotrophs are actually helping to expand the mycelial networks and increase the competitiveness uh, of, the, of the mycorrhizal partners. And so it's this very complex ecological web, which shouldn't be surprising because most, most things in nature are all kind of connected. And, and this is a great uh, example of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting when you talk about that, because how how humans are just scratching the surface of how complicated and how the ecosystem really takes care of itself. And I really would like to get in a lot more detail. But to move on, how can fungi exactly help the ecosystem where humans can benefit from it too? Um, are there any specific examples? Well, there's lots. I mean, we're, I think as, as you've seen and your generation is going to have to deal with, we are in the middle of what's known as the Anthropocene, where humans have so drastically altered the surface of the planet and destroyed so many of the ecological webs uh, that nature is basically coming to a grinding halt all around us. And we are watching systems just, just you know, completely fall apart. And I think if we go back and look, think about, you know, when plants and fungi first came to land, there was nothing there. And in some ways, we've created a lot of situations like that. Uh, big mining sites, super fun sites, places where there's basically no biological life other than maybe microbes left. And fungi are a way to get, get a foothold in that. Uh, so we can use fungi to help rehabilitate soils. Uh, there's this great species called pisolithus, which is sometimes known as dead man's foot or dye ball. And it's actually a really common fungi that you'll see in a lot of garden and soil mixtures. And it is an incredibly good uh, one at digesting heavy metals and you know getting rid and binding up some of the sort of nasty compounds that would be in soils that have been polluted. But it's also a great pioneering species in that when you have a pisolithus species established, it's much easier for other plants to come in and have their seeds germinate and be supported by the mycorrhizal relationship with that fungus. Uh, it, the Pizolithus species also produces tremendous amount of force. So if you have it on very compacted soils or even under asphalt, the Pizolithus produces enough force that it can push up through the dirt, aerating the soils or even displacing asphalt, which I've seen uh, in people's driveways. Mm -hmm. that's, that's really interesting when, you, um, when you're explaining because it can actually help the the trouble that humans technology has caused to the earth. And that's great. Um, what are some applications that can be used in pharmaceuticals, health, and overall just well-being and even cooking? <laughs> that's, that's a big question. I'll, I'll see if I can hit all the points there. Um, I think a, a thing that people don't realize is that we have been using fungal enzymes for you know years for um well over you know most of the 20th and 21st century we've been producing fungi isolating enzymes and then putting them in consumer goods something like your laundry detergent is packed full of fungal enzymes uh lipases and things that break down fats other things that'll break down you know dirt and pigments it's not just soap it's a lot of these enzymes that are, are derived from fungi so that at an industrial level is happening uh, in terms of pharmaceuticals, we've derived some very important medicines uh, from mushrooms. There's a, a cancer drug called Taxol, which inhibits the growth of um, actin or, or you know, fibers within cancer cells and, and slows down their growth. And that was originally isolated from a yew tree, but they realized after many years of research that it wasn't actually the yew tree that was producing it. In fact, it was an endophytic fungi living inside the yew tree. So they were then able to start culturing that and produce a lot more taxol, um, which was far more sustainable than just cutting down all the yew trees. Um, 
in terms of, I think, personal health, I, fungi have incredible potential to help with sustainability. They're a, a very good source of protein. Um, while they're not super high in protein, you need to eat a fair number of mushrooms to get all of the protein you would need. The composition of those amino acids of those proteins that are in mushrooms is more similar to that of animals. So if you eat an all vegetable diet uh, and it's heavy on stuff like corn and soy, which we definitely get in the United States, uh, you end up with often too much lysine, which can give health problems on its own. So eating a lot of mushrooms is a way to get a, a better protein balance for what your, your body needs, as well as providing tremendous amounts of dietary fiber and these complex polysaccharides, which work as probiotics to feed beneficial bacteria in your gut microbiome that will help reduce inflammation, increase cognitive function, uh, stimulate your immune system, all sorts of stuff. So mushrooms are this incredible food source um, as well as being, you know, very sustainable because I think I've heard some quotes that like a pound of beef takes something like 1600 gallons of water per pound of beef, whereas a pound of mushrooms takes about 12 gallons of water to grow them. So they are a very sustainable food source. Um, and I think it may be one of the only ways that we can look at providing enough protein to the rapidly expanding world population. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I agree with you because mushrooms, when you said those um, really strong based facts, I do agree with them because we need some changes. And if people are willing, which is the main problem, then we can actually begin to be more sustainable, which affects um, our technologies, even our diets. So that's why I think fungi can come here and this can really solve a lot of issues. So thank you for sharing. Sure, I mean, the one thing I'd say is with my Fascinated by Fungi account, I am trying to help people uh, dispel some mushroom myths and move beyond what I call mycophobia, where people are inherently afraid of mushrooms. Because I think in America, there was potentially a mushroom foraging culture and that was lost uh, in the middle of the 20th century, especially during World War II. And a lot of Americans are very, very afraid of mushrooms. I get a lot of messages from people who say, this thing came up in my yard. I don't want my, my dog to eat it. I don't want my baby to eat it. It must be poisonous. And most of the time, they're not poisonous. Uh, there's not that many mushrooms that are very poisonous. There are some, and they can definitely kill you. But if you don't eat a mushroom, uh, it's not going to hurt you. You can't really be harmed from touching a mushroom. Mushrooms in your soil just means you have healthy soil. And what I'm trying to do is, is help dispel that mycophobia by educating people, because the more you learn and the more you're able to identify things on your own, the less fear you have and the more open you are to accepting mushrooms as food and as medicine and, you know, potentially as a solution for solving environmental issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially we have to really, the, there is an awareness issue and I'm glad that you're able to educate people to be able to get the facts right and to let them know that fungi and mushrooms can benefit society so much more than we actually think. I 100% so, yeah. agree. <laughs> yeah, again, I was joined by Dr. Gordon Walker. Absolutely, thanks for having me, it's been fun.